Hi, and welcome to Night Clerk Radio. This is episode 79, Vaporwave and Architectural Horror. This is a near and dear topic to me, and I'm very excited for this episode because Burke here has written some notes and see, and I'm I'm quite excited to dive into this topic. So do you want to uh, lay out the foundations of this episode there, Burke? Yeah, sure. No problem. So going back to like old school topic episodes with this, mm-hmm. where we're going to talk about architecture horror. I'm going to do a little elevator pitch, kind of let people know what it is, what, how it differs from some other subgenres, why we like it. Mm-hmm. I think to help concrete that idea, we can talk about <laughs> some common, hey, hey, fuck, that was an accident. Anyway, <laughs> hey, I, I said the foundation of this episode. I was, <laughs> you know what? You're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. God damn. Anyway, <laughs> give some examples, I think, mm-hmm. of stuff that satisfies so people kind of know what we're talking about in more concrete settings. And mm-hmm. then I think it actually has a lot of interesting, like, socio-political, philosophical connections to other topics we've discussed on the show and to Vaporwave in general. So we're going to do the standard uh, annoyingly over-intellectualized Vaporwave for a bit today. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'll just start with a quick elevator pitch and you can add to it as needed. But architectural horror is also one of my favorites. I, I really, really like, really, really like all the examples we're going to talk about today. But it's a subgenre of horror that I sort of define as focusing on the psychological impact of location and environment on those interacting with it. Mm-hmm. And those locations and environments have to have a man-made element to them. They have to be something that people have created that people later are interacting with. Mm-hmm. So like just being trapped on a mountaintop is not, you know, the environment's affecting you. Yeah. It could be like supernatural, but it's not, not something people made. So common examples are like haunted houses, yeah. buildings, like that's the most basic example. And just studying the impact of being trapped in these horrific environments on the human experience. Uh, and then generally, as we'll see later, getting into kind of criticism of the sociopolitical circumstances that gave rise to their creation. I agree with that because if you think of like, what is architecture? It is mm-hmm. the the art and the science of shaping an environment to suit our purposes. Purpose is integral to architecture. It is uh, making deliberate changes to a space for a reason. It could be, you know, something you want, something you need, but mm-hmm. that is like the, the, the core of what architecture is. So architectural horror is, yeah, obviously in man-made environments, and it's about purpose. It is someone purposefully doing something that causes horror. Now, this could be like deliberate, like I'm targeting a specific person for a specific mm-hmm. reason, or it could be indifference. The brutality of the 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 nature of this building creates evil as a byproduct, and it's you know doesn't care, and you know the architect doesn't care or didn't anticipate that. You know, there's unanticipated things. Mm-hmm. And when you look at horror, like horror is, you know, a morality, uh, you know, parable, don't do this or the bad thing will happen. But like a lot of horror is about nature or the supernatural, which is something from, you know, God or the devil or uh, something natural, you know, something from that Mm. was the opposite of man-made, you know, a shark, a bear, the monster in the dark. And it's about man's inability to deal with something greater than themselves. you know, God, devil or nature and right. architectural horror is no, it's other people are doing this to the, uh, the victims or the protagonists of this, uh, narrative. And so, yeah, you're definitely right that the haunted house subgenre of horror is pretty much all architectural horror to some degree. Mm-hmm. But obviously there are a lot of examples that are not just like ghosts or haunted houses. <laughs> There's a lot to dig into. Right. But yeah. I think that's sort of like, yeah, as, as a definition, you have to think of like purpose and intent Mm -hmm. as opposed to God, you know, something supernatural or natural. Yeah, exactly. So I I think we'll just continue on with more concrete media examples, kind of where I want to go. So I personally picked one of each from the non music mediums. We typically Mm -hmm. talk here. So like one book, one film and one video game are are things we generally talk about. Yeah. So for books, I'm going to take the opportunity to get into some pretentious literature. (laughs) And my, my book example was house of leaves, right? So it's a group of people come to a house. It's physics defying, you know, it's larger on the inside than it is on the outside. It constantly 
you know, it's labyrinthine inside. It's seemingly endless, spatially impossible for them to interact with. Everything is shifting and changing. And the, the book sort of examines how that house affects the people that kind of come through it. Like it almost responds to their traumas and fears mm-hmm. and is, is sort of ever manipulating and tormenting them as they're stuck there. Uh, and that sort of also bleeds out into form. Like House of Leaves is famous for like weird formatting, like you know, words the wrong way and, and stuff like that. And layered narratives too. Like yeah, there's, yeah. there's, there's the story of the person who finds a manuscript from a dead man, uh, the dead man's apartment about which the book is about a documentary about the house. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's, there's a lot of interaction. I need to reread that because I, yeah. I, 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 it took me several tries to actually read the entire thing, but now I need to reread it to be like, Hmm, what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's like a lot of, themes of, of recursion because the house itself is kind of, you know, seemingly impossibly endless or fractal on the inside, mm-hmm. but also like the manuscript you're just talking about the, the Navidson record or whatever. I think so. Yeah. I think is what it's called. It's been a while since I read it actually, but I remember that having like footnotes upon that lead to footnotes that lead to footnotes that lead to footnotes that don't exist. So oh, it's yeah. like the manuscript itself is like mm-hmm. a microcosm of the house in its own endless physically impossible recursive way. But yeah, it just, feeds off all the people who enter it and it's bad for them. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I can do all my examples because it looks like the ones you wrote in the notes, just a little live editing yeah, are, are also largely filmed. So we can do film last. Okay. Yeah. Like visual media last for mine were, were recent things like things that I've, mm. I've seen in the last year or so that were uh, architectural horror, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So I'll skip, film on my list though and then video games are real quick there's a lot of options i mm-hmm. i thought about silent hill but that's really more of like the whole town than a building personally mm-hmm. i mean you can do architecture about a town like I'm, yeah I'm go- yeah urban design and city design i uh, go into it as well but like yeah keeping with the building theme i picked something else then mm-hmm. so i went with layers of fear mm-hmm. i don't know if you ever played that or if i did it. i played yeah. the first one yeah About like what five six years ago maybe more something like that point. yeah yeah but you play a victorian painter just kind of losing their mind at the end of their life mm-hmm. and trying to navigate their, their mansion as they are <laughs> fade away into nothingness basically. <laughs> and it has the same idea of like, everything is like nonlinear and disorienting. Like that's a, re- that's a repeated theme is like nonlinearity manipulation of space. That's a really common sense of horror because horror has to make you feel uneasy and like you have no control. Mm-hmm. So if you, constantly feel lost in the space or something that's going to to add to that yeah so yeah for films oh i guess i should start with this Mm. yeah in the last couple actually in the last year there's architectural horror is interesting because and we'll get into this more later but like um you're sort of like a venn diagram with like analog horror liminal horror and architectural horror and they there's a lot of overlap (laughs) between them and uh actually you know i've I've watched two movies over the last couple days a, a sort of preparation for this the most recent one I've seen is called Inside, which stars Willem Dafoe just came out. And it's mm-hmm. about an art thief who breaks into this, you know, sky rise apartment, sky, you know, of a very rich art collector to steal, you know, multi-million dollar paintings. And then gets trapped inside this apartment filled with all this priceless art, but very little food or water. And, you know, he's trying to get out. Uh, and so he's trapped literally by the architecture. It's like this concrete. Mm. Or, the windows are too thick to shatter. The security system malfunctions and causes it to go too hot or too cold. And he's just, you know, there's hidden rooms and it's it's about the architecture, you know, imprisoning uh, William Defoe. And it's it's all just William Defoe. It's like he's <laughs> he's alone in the, almost the entire movie aside from a flashback scene. And in terms of another movie that just came out recently this year is called Skinnamarink, uh, which is on Shutter right now and is a haunted house film uh, that I read being described as from the perspective of the haunted house. It's about two kids trapped inside this suburban house and uh, the doors and the windows disappear and they, you know, the lights gradually, you know, they're watching cartoons on a VCR and they're, they don't know what's going on. It's um, a challenging film to watch because it loves holding like long static shots of just like the TV at a weird angle as you can hear sounds, you know, sort of happening. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very hypnagogic, like you're all, you're like, 
<laughs> it's literally a challenge to watch without falling asleep, especially if you watch it late at night, which is what I did. <laughs> but it does get very scary and it, it's a unique experience. So if you like weird vapor wave, it's, it's dark ambient, the movie, too, because it's mm. uh, yeah, very layered and textured as a film. But then last year, there's a movie called Barbarian, mm-hmm. which I don't want to spoil too much, but there it does feature like an extensive you know, a house with a secret tunnel leading down into a maze and weird things, you know, dark things happening in that. And uh, literally one of the characters who finds the hidden maze in this house starts like, oh, wait, this adds to my property value. Mm-hmm. So it's like uh, mm-hmm. it's like measuring out the basement and everything. It's actually a pretty funny scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. So um, that's uh, worth watching. This has a lot to say about suburbia. And speaking of suburbia, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017. Uh, so like five years ago or whatever, or six years. Jesus. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sci-Fi Channel had the series called Channel Zero, which was taking creepypasta from the Internet, making it into like a season of TV. So it was like American Horror Story, but for creepy pasta. And the second mm. season is called No End House, which is like, you know, some people go into this haunted house attraction uh they come out and they they're this pocket universe of a suburban development of like mcmansions like for like 10 or 20 square blocks and they're trapped there and they don't know what's going on everything's weird and all these doppelgangers based on their memories of people they know appear and sort of like start draining the memories out of them like and it's it's a very weird and you know about the the alienation disassociation of suburbia and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my my unfortunate example is it's a very normy example, but it is a great movie. Mm-hmm. Absolute classic. The Shining mm-hmm. 80s Kubrick based off Stephen King loosely, which is why it actually works instead of most Stephen King adaptations. <laughs> They're like, just take the book, but take out all the underage stuff. Yeah. Looking yeah. at you, it. Looking at you, it. Mm-hmm. But it's about, you know, Jack Nicholson plays uh, Jack Burns, who has to go and be a, a caretaker at the Overlook Hotel, which is a spooky mm-hmm. sort of haunted hotel, and it drives him mad as he's stuck there. And the architecture of the hotel, like there's a recurring theme again of like nonlinearity and mazes. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the film example is interesting because much like the attempt to bring some of those themes into the formatting of the text in House of Leaves, a lot of this is the these like uncertainties about your spatial environment in the overlook hotel are brought mm-hmm. from the page into like visual language so the architecture the way Kubrick built a lot of these sets actually are spatially impossible mm-hmm. in a sense and you, you may not notice it because characters don't interact with it but if you thought about it or like it may throw your brain off because there'll be like they'll come in through a door but there'll be like a hallway where mm-hmm. like that door shouldn't be able to go anywhere uh, like like these types of things on on purpose. Another good example of that actually is the Seinfeld apartment. Oh yeah. If you look at the hallway, <laughs> such a stupid example. But if you look at the hallway where everyone, because it's a you know it's a stage set, doesn't actually matter. The hallway would cut through his kitchen. Yeah. At the angle, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is shown, it would like cut off the corner of his kitchen. That actually reminds that's me. Why yeah, Seinfeld's sorry. so hard to watch. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. No, that actually reminds me of a Seinfeld episode. There's mm. one that's basically ghost written by jg mm-hmm. ballard where mm. the characters are trapped in an under in a parking garage and oh, they, yeah. yeah and they're just trapped there the entire episode they just keep going to different levels they're like where are we you know they're questioning their own existence <laughs> and yeah and which is great it's probably my favorite episode of the uh, series the and the shining you, you if you're talking about architectural horror you have to talk about the shining like it's such yeah kubrick is a master yeah absolutely yeah it's fantastic mm-hmm did you have any other media examples you wanted to do? Or do you want to talk about some other stuff? I mean, there's a lot you could talk about video games. I was thinking, you know, when you mentioned Layers of Fear, the game that came to mm. mind, uh, I think it's uh, what's the game where you're it's it, it's you're, you're a person inside and in the same asylum and you have like a little video camera with you. The evil within. No, it's no. it's it's like amnesia where you don't have any means to attack. Outlast. Outlast. Yeah. So Outlast, yeah, you're you're literally trapped in this asylum mm. uh, as it breaks down. You know, there it, it's it's a staple of like survival horror and horror games of the architecture being an element of this this design space turning into a dungeon to trap you. So I I, I think you know there's actually a new brand new game that came out that that seems interesting called Meet Your Maker, 
where mm-hmm. you literally design a you go through a dungeon to get the the get the loot at the middle and then try and get your way out. The the gimmick is that players design the dungeons. So you take so you design your own dungeon and then offline, you know, while you're offline or whatever, the other players can run through that into and you can see what your stats are every time you kill a player, you get, you know, some sort of power up or your you know mm-hmm. bonus points. But like, you know, they you're literally playing both roles you're both the 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 trap maker and the dungeon maker and the uh uh, person trying to get through the dungeon so i find that an interesting aspect that you know it's it's weaponized architecture in the game i've forgotten about outlast that's not so bad actually that's a good example yeah one worth revisiting Mm -hmm. yeah there's like a c there's a couple sequels now yeah there's one that's just coming out that looks like there's a big overlap between like video games and then like, you know, the jigsaw, the architectural horror style of like mm-hmm. trap rooms and escape rooms and um, that kind of thing. Like, uh, yeah, I just I also a month ago watched the Japanese version of Cube, which came out last year and it was it's architectural horror. But like, you know, it's it's not as good as the original. OK, so it is related to the Canadian Cube. It's not. Yeah, it's 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 just a Japanese remake or okay. uh, like okay. it's it's new traps and new characters, but there it's a it's the cube we all know and love it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you love cube? Yep. So yeah, there there is kind of a whole a whole subgenre of architectural horror, especially if you think of like yeah, trap rooms, escape rooms, saw type movies. Um, and a little bit, yeah, yeah. There's actually a Spanish movie. Uh, God, I just thought of it called Fermat's Room where four mathematicians are put in this room and the walls start slowly closing in. They have to solve puzzles to keep the walls mm. from pressing in and they have to figure out who would lead them into this death trap. It's a good metaphor for publisher parish. <laughs> yeah. I like that. But yeah. It gets into like famous mathematical puzzles and stuff like that. Like, mm. so uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty neat movie. It's, the architecture is, is again, it's about purpose. So, so when you want to design something sadistic, or something, you know, well, you could argue prison movies are architect, you know, horrific prison movies are all architectural horror because, you know, we have the panopticon and all of that legacy and history mm-hmm. uh, lending itself to horror. Mm-hmm. It's a robust field. That's right. And I think one of the reasons it's so interesting is that you can map it onto a lot of other stuff we deal with, <laughs> like kind of mm-hmm. moving on to like the socio political connections or mm-hmm. philosophical connections, because there's a lot of architecture even now that is not supernatural, but that you interact with day to day that is sort of sets you at unease. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, I think a a good example we came up with on the discord is our obsession with like Eastern block architecture, like that brutalist Mm -hmm. Soviet era. Um, There's two really good books, uh, monotown and Eastern block that cover a lot of this. And there's like this unease because they're so uniform. Right. And you kind of have a lot of this, cold war propaganda in your head about the conditions under which they were built you know like monotowns were like post-industrial soviet factory downs basically like here's a factory or an industrial complex we build a bunch of the same buildings around it and everyone just kind of has to live and work there Mm -hmm. but i think the reason that's more largely interesting and why you know our our dirty u.s centric minds come in easy with that is that i think it almost maps i think architectural horror is like a direct physical mapping onto Mark Fisher's ontology. That's like largely one of the things I wanted to talk about Mm -hmm. because if as a quick kind of one sentence review, when we talk about ontology in in Fisher's sense, it's pulled from Derrida and it's all the ways in which these past structures and systems and choices and events and people, et cetera, kind of exert themselves through history onto the present and future subjects in some sense. Largely this is in the context of, continuing obsession with Marx through the fall of the Berlin wall onto in in Fisher's sense, it was more of like media and like lack of cultural progress. And now we're kind of always obsessed with our culture's past instead of pushing our culture forward Mm -hmm. and buildings, I think map onto that. Right. So the building itself is a a stand in for whatever societal system that generally when you interact with it in architectural horror, it was built in the past through somebody else's decisions and those past bad decisions now impose themselves on whoever interacts with it in the future or, you know, the present of the narrative, but the future Mm -hmm. after it was built. So yeah, that past manifesting to interact with us. So 
you know, you look at buildings that we think of as like haunted by Soviet era aesthetics. That's just like Spectre of Arcs type shit mm-hmm. coming on us now. And this manifests so like a common thing in it's a little hacky and tropey in architectural horror is that the circumstances under which that building was erected were impure or like inappropriate in some sense. So, you know, Poltergeist and The Shining, for example, both have like, oh, they actually built this area on, you know, indigenous burial grounds. And mm-hmm. that's why it's haunted. Because, you know, a hundred years ago, some capitalist made very short term considerations about or, or zero ethical considerations about what they're doing. And now it's fucking everybody 40 years later. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you can see this in uh, Skinner Rink and No End House because they're both about like, mm-hmm. you know, literally they're trapped in a McMansion hell in in No End House. You know, like these these buildings that were meant to be part of a investment portfolio, not meant to actually be lived in, are now like mm-hmm. draining the life force out of the people trapped within there. They're they're They can't get out, you know, like they're so far away from everything else. And then in Skinner Rink, like it's two kids who are trapped in this, you know, normally beige house that mm-hmm. is now only bathed in the light of a few lamps and like a television as their, you know, mom and dad disappear and, you know, they hear voices mm. in the darkness. And obviously, you know, metaphors for the alienation of, of suburbia, you know, just these low density uh, developments where everyone's trapped in their own house and they don't know who their neighbor is. There's no way to really reach out or can't get to their friends, can't get anywhere without a car. And yeah, mm. imagine being the, yeah, the kids of Skinner Rink are like kids now, like they can't go anywhere. There's no third place for them to congregate, to, to be kids. Mm. There's nothing left to do but to watch a screen inside. And uh, then now the doors are gone. I mean, yeah. No, I agree. I think that's very true. Yeah. It's just, it's just interesting. I, th- I think it's just, it's just a good mapping that makes sense in my mind. Yeah. I think it would be interesting to look, you could probably find like for any type of architecture, find architectural horror about it and like, uh, mm. and to represent like what is horrific about it because, you know, obviously you could do the shopping mall, you know, Dawn of the dead and even things, you know, like shopping mall, uh, but yeah, that's kind <laughs> of outdated. So yeah, I, I think maybe that would be interesting to look at like types of architecture and see what kind of horror it, it, it inspires. So like, you know, I mentioned mm-hmm. suburbia is like the horror's alienation, disassociation, an ennui, mm-hmm. a spiritual ennui, because the kids in like Skin and Rink are very scared and passive and you barely see them mm-hmm. on camera like they're they're already disassociating. You can only hear them off camera a lot of the time in no end house. You know, the characters are literally being drained of their vitality, you know by these leech like doppelganger characters. Mm-hmm. And it's very and they're being replaced by the doppelgangers. So, yeah, I think that would be interesting. So, like, The Shining is about, like, it was the 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 Overlook Hotel was like a, a uh, hangout for the rich and famous. And as they engaged in vice and Sid and decadence, mm. and it was built on, you know, this genocidal thing. And so the evil there is very direct in, like, control of patriarchy you know, uh, genocide. And as the, you know, Jack Nicholson spoilers for a very, you know, 40 year old <laughs> movie, uh, uh, once decides to kill his family. Right. And yeah. that's more direct than like no end house. <laughs> a little more. Direct. That's true. Yeah. More direct. But I think in, in both cases, the other thing I wanted to connect to Mark Fisher mm-hmm. along the lines you were just talking about is his concept of capitalist realism, mm-hmm. which is the idea that you're so, born into and continually raised by capitalist ideology that it just becomes your ontology, right? It becomes the, the entire by which you understand the world to exist. Mm -hmm. It completely remaps how you perceive everything. Like even if you're think of yourself as anti-capitalist or whatever, you probably still have used a lot of the language. We always talk about like value and worth and and Mm -hmm. stuff, right? Like these are things that don't have to matter, but you, you do. Like it bleeds its way into your thoughts. It's everything. It's, yeah. it's completely unavoidable. And I think there's, this is a weaker connection, but I think, do you think that the kind of incomprehensible forces that someone interacts with through these systems, the characters are changed, right? It does affect their perception of reality. Oh, sure. Like their trajectory through the world is, is forever altered by interacting with these systems against their will. Yeah. I, I think there's some, some relationship there. Yeah, no, actually that there's uh you know, cube, the characters mm-hmm. start out being just like kind of normal people. What, what's going on? You know, and then as they 
adapt to the cube like they become like more brutish and like uh mm-hmm. yeah, some lose their mind some like you know will shove their fellow prisoners into death traps so they can get an advantage <laughs> you know another example actually would be inside because like william defoe's character he just mm-hmm. sneaks into this thing he's you know he disguises as a, as a workman but once he's cut off he gradually you know, removes his uniform, wears the clothes of there and starts drawing on the wall. He's actually like reveal. He's an art thief, but he's also an artist and he actually knows the curator, the, the person he's stealing from. So, mm. but like he starts drawing on the walls, he's, he's, he goes mad. Like he's so he's trapped in this place so long that he goes entirely mad. He eats the fish in the fish tank, you know, like, <laughs> and by the end of it, he's just like this raving madman, you know, uh, almost, but he, you know, well, by the end of the movie, I don't want to say, uh, I guess spoiling that a little bit, but, uh, anyway, <laughs> it's a good movie. You should still watch it. It's, it's, it's about, the, it's a character study, right? It's about this person's descent into capital realism. Like you can look at it as a metaphor. Once he's trapped in there, he has to adapt everything to survive in this space. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's about adapting to like forces that you have no control over. Like he's utterly helpless in that building. There's some scenes where like he can hear the uh, one of the workers outside vacuuming outside the door of the apartment. But the door is so thick and she's wearing she's wearing earbuds. She can't hear him cry out for help. Like I'm in here, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I I I can totally see that because you look at the look at the character arc in architectural horror. Jack Nicholson Mm -hmm. going being from, you know, kind of a weird but normal guy like to uh you know a murderer that wants to kill his you know wife and kid i could totally see that. that's a really good point actually yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It just it just changes who you are in in ways that you don't like or don't want to mm-hmm. so given that it lends itself well to mark fisher and we've shown that mark fisher lends itself well to vapor wave mm-hmm. i think we'll close out by moving kind of into to part three of mm-hmm. this discussion which is tying everything that we've talked about back to Broadly vaporwave, or if you want to say like haunted music, now I say vaporwave because it's easier, but I think everyone knows what we mean by that. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be any of the, the multiple subgenres that are out there. It doesn't have to be exactly early tens of vaporwave or something, you know, mm-hmm. I sort of organized this in my mind along three main points, which is uh, similarity in aesthetics, similarity in atmosphere and similarity in themes. So We'll start with aesthetics because aesthetics <laughs> are the most important mm-hmm. in vaporwave, obviously. Oh, sure. So I have sort of points we'll kind of walk through. And and one thing I'll say is that as we go through this, I, I do think there's going to be one repeated theme that will come up, which is the effect of the past on the, the present and the future. Mm-hmm. But I, I think vaporwave and architecture are more interesting because they both use a visual language that's dependent on uncanny images of the past to evoke emotions in the consumer, the listener or the viewer or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, skin and marine. If you just look at a screenshot of it, you can see like it's vaporwave as fuck. Like it's like (laughs) literally grainy. Like the color palette is very muted, but like very, uh, there's a lot of in that movie about like the, yeah, the, the, the palette of old consumer recording technology, you know, there's a lot mm-hmm. about VHS and v, VCR and those come up a lot. Mm-hmm. Like anytime you have, I mean, it's just become a thing in horror to like it, people don't watch things on DVD. They watch them on VHS. You know, if there's a haunted, mm-hmm. there's like a murder, a recording of a, of a murder or a, a ghost or whatever. You damn right. It's going to be a VHS. It's not going to be Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be in 1080. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I uh, definitely agree with that. A- aesthetic point two. We'll just walk through these. Mm-hmm. I've kind of written out is both engaged with themes of temporality and passage of time. This kind of goes back to the idea of, again, what happens in the past mm-hmm. uh, has an impact on our fragile nature of our perception of the world today, specifically in vaporwave and, and architecture. It's just the haze of memories or, not, or past knowledge, right? So in vaporwave, there's a lot of we've talked about where you have anachronistic images or like slush wave is designed to be, you know, kind mm-hmm. of hazy notions of the past because the samples are, are so mutated or uncanny memories of what it was like to go shopping or to sit in a cubicle or to go on summer vacation or, or whatever. And I think this maps back on to just, again, the aspect of good horse shatters the character's perception mm-hmm. of the present. And that sort of goes into the next point, which is like liminality 
and like abandonment in transitional spaces. So just this blurring of boundaries between the familiar and the unknown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, a lot, you need a baseline in horror, right? Like you need, you can't Mm -hmm. just go into the scary thing first. You have to, this is normal in this world. And then the scary thing happens. So like vaporwave. And so it's about that, like, you know, the dissonance between the normal and the abnormal and vaporwave is all about that too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And also just a lot of architectural horror, you know, and I was saying it, it relies on like uncanny versions of the past, which is, is sort of like the first point of visual language, but also like the passage of time and the haziness or, or misunderstanding of past eras. You know, a lot of times the architecture in architectural horror is architecture of the past, it's like Gothic or Victorian mm-hmm. or Brutalist or, or whatever, just designed to be kind of disorienting and take you out of uh, out of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot of times it's literally the the architect's malign intent from the past mm-hmm. still affecting the others, you know, in terms of things, you know, that are, uh, again, like The Shining, you know, like the Overlook Hotel mm-hmm. was designed bad from the start. And like it, yep. its legacy is just fucking over the family now. Mm-hmm. The last one was, was kind of interesting to me, but needs a little more delving into is that both deal with understanding the effect of alternative psychological states Hmm. on the people that listen to them. So now they don't deal with the same ones, which is sort of an interesting duality. So vaporwave often tends to be about like the vibe, right? Vibing like, or, or hypnagogia, nostalgia, escapism, maybe a little disorientation and comfort, which we've talked about, but generally it's generally designed to highlight positive aspects of some past. Again, nostalgia or escapism with a little hint of like, yeah, yeah, they're idealized, and that idealization gives you a little bit of disorientation, mm-hmm. right? So there's like that that thin layer. And architectural horror is sort of flipped because it's horror. It, it most directly deals with like trauma and anxiety, mm-hmm. but generally has some little bit of catharsis or, or something that comes out of it for the people involved. Mm-hmm. So they're, it's, it's yin and yang, man. <laughs> but they both kind of deal with like oppressive and haunted spaces, but from different angles. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So we can move on to, um, the atmosphere, which I don't know how that's different from aesthetics. It was in my mind when I wrote out these notes. (laughs) Well, I mean, aesthetics is like literally visual, literally what it looks like. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. What does it feel like? Yeah, that's right. Again, first and foremost, we always say is, is the uncanny distortion of familiar elements of our past. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and the effect of that, both on nostalgia and mm-hmm. our sense of alienation. I mean, again, the classic example, The Shining, is the like the photo of like uh, the 1920s New Year's ball mm-hmm. at the Overlook Hotel, and then of course we see Jack Nicholson at the end. You know, he's always been here. You know, or like mm-hmm. seeing the Overlook fully populated with the 1920s, you know, ghosts, and then yeah, that that juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's always meant to be disorienting. You're unsure of. What reality you're in? Are you mm-hmm. dreaming? Mm-hmm. Confusion, isolation, yeah. powerlessness. Uh, you know, it's just yeah that that the notion of like just continually repeating the idea that the past haunts the present. Yeah, you can never really be free of it. It's always gonna mess with you in in some other ways. So like I think we talk about themes of disorientation, mm-hmm. right? So what's interesting is I think vaporwave that disorientation is often disorientation or displacement in time. Mm-hmm. Right. So they're, they're complementary. Right. So again, some idealized weird version of the seventies or the eighties or the nineties or, the right. or, or, or whatever, some alternate reality that never really existed and really in some sense can't have ever existed. Whereas architecture is more spatially related, right? Mm-hmm. Labyrinthine, spatial configurations, environment shift. So it's like, are you lost in time or lost in space? Yeah. But both use one of those axes to, to unsettle you. Well, there's also like uh, in, in horror, you know, um, mm. like we going back earlier about supernatural, natural things like, you know, it's a punishment for God, a curse from the devil or like it's mm. nature, you know, bears are scary. Right. Mm. And th- in which case it's almost always like a direct aggressive antagonist, like a, a, a animalistic or intelligent force going against the protagonist, trying to hunt them, stalk them, curse them, whatever. But like mm-hmm. in architectural horror, it's more passive. 
Right. There's this ambiguity, this this sort of like, is the ghost real? Am I going crazy? Even when the ghost is trying to murder me, it's not all there's no physical body. Like the physical body is the walls of the house. But you can't like punch. I mean, you can punch a house, but that's not gonna like it's a <laughs> little should. Yeah. But like shooting Jason Voorhees <laughs> is a little more effective than shooting the wall of a haunted house. Like you don't that's true. Yeah, you don't really do much. You can set the house on fire. But that's about it. And like if the house is in, if the house is made of concrete or whatever, that doesn't really do anything. Right. So I think there's this like the enemy to fight is literally a ghost or it's haunted or it's 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 not a direct foe that you can just face in combat mm-hmm. or run away from. I mean, you can you can try to escape the house unless you're imprisoned. So there's that that, that sort of incongruity between like is the antagonist is the adversary literally something I can like physically deal with or does it have a body? It kind of has a body, but it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I I think the last kind of point I have under atmosphere, which is like escapism and critique really blends into themes. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to connect them that they, they both use these atmospheres to critique stuff. We've already talked about this episode, but I Mm -hmm. think like both first and foremost attack kind of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Often about like consumerism, shallow ephemeral decision-making, which is usually only good in the moment because it made somebody a profit, mm-hmm. right? And then later it, it turns out to be very bad for all the people after the fact, but you know, not my problem. I'm already dead. I got my money, mm-hmm. lived my good life, et cetera. So, you yeah, know, unchecked consumerism and capitalism. It's kind of the first most obvious choice. It also relates back to all the Mark Fisher stuff we were talking about. Oh, sure. I mean, pretty much all the media we've talked about so far, you could trace it, it's capitalism, you know, the shining, like the family's hired to be yeah. a caretaker for this house, you know, this, this hotel yeah. that is a playground for the rich. Right. And he, he, he has to, I don't know if he has to, but a major motivating factor is that he's kind of like a struggling writer. Yeah. So he has financial incentive to go make easy money and do this three month, you know, caretaker job. And the, while he works on the novel. Yeah. Well, he works on other stuff and you know, he has to drag his family along because mm-hmm. they all depend on each other mm-hmm. for survival and, and everyone gets dragged into it. Mm-hmm. And again, like Skinner Marine could no end house, like suburban mm-hmm. developments. Those are the kind of houses families are moving into, even though you're alienating, mm-hmm. you're alone, you know, and it kind of su- you, yep. you need a car. So it kind of sucks. Uh, yeah. Barbar- and, you know, inside, he's literally an art thief. He's literally <laughs> trying to steal from the rich. True. Sure. Yeah, I mean, House of Leaves would be a little harder, but I'd have to, I mean, that, that novel's so dense. So. I haven't read it in yeah. like 10 years, so yeah. I'd have to, that, that's a harder one. The yeah. Books are a difficult one to do yeah. on the on the fly. Yeah. So uh, other themes, I think there's a lot of stuff about technology, mm-hmm. right? So Vaporwave often has elements of like the alienation of technology, VR, AR type things. Mm-hmm. Or just like the rapid obsolescence of computers, you know, like. Yeah. Just like, oh, it's yep. Windows 95. That was popular. That was like a cornerstone of computers mm. 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And now it's a Again, joke. that everything is immediate and ephemeral and is only matters for a little bit. And then it's gone forever, discarded into the waste bin of history, mm-hmm. I suppose. I think that's a lot of like also abandoned buildings. You know, things we built don't need anymore. So we just let them rot, et cetera. So there's like a double-edged sword there of kind of like these new exciting possibilities, but because of the systems we're in, they always get repurposed into less compelling or beneficial. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, the technology, like a lot of it's about the failure of Mm -hmm. buildings to adapt to times like buildings are met with certain standards whenever they're built. And, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously like the staple of the haunted house is, you know, the house is old and, you know, mm-hmm. it doesn't quite adapt to modern technology and that incongruity. And the, on the flip side, you have sci-fi things like Cube, which is about, you know, bullshit yeah. fictional sci-fi technology being instead of using to, you know, better the lives of people, the people who made, you know, the, the architects of Cube made it to like <laughs> imprison, torture and kill people like which is right. Kind of fucked up. That, yeah. that was what got funding, huh? You got that. That's exactly. that's what got ten billion dollars. My her will pay for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all very silly and I I think that sort of you know leads into kind of the last point I had which is that both are really about decay and Mm -hmm. dystopia Mm -hmm. again kind of like just wrapping up everything that we just talked about kind of falls under this this headline of letting things rock because they don't we don't care about them sure well like the 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 average you know the most intro critique you can make of like the haunted house genre is that they're all metaphors Mm -hmm. for a family 
a family's decline. Cause like that, that's the typical haunted house thing is a new family moves into an old house. They find their ghosts and then bad things happen. And you know, it's the, the, the decay of the family. Like, and usually the dynamic is the father moves, you know, gets the family to move here to, for a new job or new life or whatever. And, you know, things don't work out the way they thought they would. You know, it's it, they thought it was going to be utopia. They thought they were going to be happy here. And it turns it into a dystopia because there's ghosts. But the ghosts really represent a failing marriage and like childhood alienation <laughs> or abuse or whatever right. else. And, you know, that's kind of like the average. And that's that's just the haunted mm-hmm. house. That's just literally just ghosts. You know, your insidious, <laughs> your empty bills, your poltergeists. So, like, it, it, it's all about like and. Almost all architectural horror is about some sort of decay of a person or, you know, the protagonist as they are subjected to someone else's architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of it is, I think it was like tension between idealized past and the future reality, Mm -hmm. you know, or the, the reality of that past or those past decisions. So to go back to one of the examples we've talked about a lot is Barbarian, right? Mm -hmm. So the Airbnb in which Barbarian is set in the, present or the, the primary word of the narrative is in like an absolute you know rundown collapsed neighborhood mm-hmm. that has nothing going for it at all except for this one house that's like you know a flipper mm-hmm. <laughs> restored house into an airbnb and everything else is just on fire and dark and non-powered and you go back into the past of that that suburban neighborhood and in the past, it's it's presented very idyllically, right? I yeah. mean, all the grass is green, all the houses are brightly painted. I mean, it has nice working cars. Very 1950s. Yeah, yeah. even though it's not supposed to be the 50s, right? It's supposed to be like the 70s or yeah, something. Yeah, white picket fences and all that jazz. So. Yeah. But even in that idealized past, those people are still like, oh, this town neighborhood's going to shit. We got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, code for, I think, non-white people are moving in. Yeah, it's largely, 100% that. Um, white flight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all, you know, it's it's my flight in Detroit, basically, Mm -hmm. you know, because they all made the choice and had the material means to just pick up and abandon this neighborhood. You know, it ends up the source of this absolutely horrific experience for this woman. You know, we, I I totally forgot about the Airbnb angle uh, uh, for Barbarian, but yeah, yeah, like the whole thing is about like, yeah, Airbnb. That's why he's obsessed, despite the basement obviously being like a murder maze. Yeah. So he's obsessed with how big it is mm-hmm. because it's just more square footage you list on Airbnb. Yeah. That's like all it is. It's that's amazing. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point. Um, coincidentally, um, <laughs> Caleb and I went out uh, for a weekend to meet up with some friends and we rented a big Airbnb Airbnb. Mm. And um, you know, like the the Airbnb experience is like it looks great in the photos, and when you get there, it seems okay. And then the longer you stay there, the more you notice of its defects, the more oh, yeah. the flaws you notice, and like Caleb had this great phrase for it, which he described as Potemkin luxury, which is one, <laughs> a great name for a vaporwave artist. And it's true. two, like the most true description of Airbnb I've ever heard in my life. Like it is 100% <laughs> dead on because like every single Airbnb looks great. And then like, oh, mm-hmm. oh, ah. like the longer you stay there. Hope, fortunately, yeah. we haven't gotten to where we found a murder basement in any Airbnb we say to, but I feel like it's only inevitable before we're like, oh, there's a yeah. murder basement down there. Maybe we should move. <laughs> yeah. And this is even in, in not just Airbnbs, but where you live because there's so much, I think it's still going on, but it's definitely slowed a little bit. There's so much house flipping culture mm-hmm. because like mortgages were so cheap. Yeah. Even two years ago that when you look at stuff, you can tell because everything is like the most generic. 50% gray mm-hmm. and like the same, uh, I like the way they're phrased by Epic philosophy, who is a, um, epoch philosophy rather, mm-hmm. who is a, a YouTuber I like, but he just bought a house and he was talking about, you can tell it was a flipper house because there's this nice, you know, live, laugh, love aesthetic about everything. But the sub floors under that new shitty mm-hmm. bow hardwood are all shitty. And like under that nice, supposedly fixed drywall, all the stuff isn't really, up to code or yeah, know, really secured very well. And, and mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's, it's all superficial. It's just all, it's all superficial, all, all surface. And yeah, barbarians a lot about that. Like the surface looks nice. And then when you dig into it, boy, mm-hmm. it ain't, it ain't good. There's some dry mm-hmm. rot in that house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think kind of the end point then is to wrap it up mm-hmm. is that I think it's important to look at the ways in which Different, very different genres and mediums of vaporwave and architectural horror 
from completely different angles attack largely the same subject. And I think that's what's so interesting about art analysis is drawing those parallels of like, clearly there's problems in how we do stuff because numerous absolutely discrepant genres and mediums have all decided that this is a problem and needs to be commented on. Yeah, it's true. That's the thing about like, our, yeah, it is, it is a commentary. It is in, in more like a lot of horror is visceral and just meant to be like, oh my God, this is scary. But like architectural horror is almost always a critique what we do to ourselves. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. In our next episode, we will also be visiting the past again uh, <laughs> as we <laughs> look at the music of Terror Vision, which I have, uh, uh, in the efforts of uh, fairness, I have taken money for them because they, uh, or rather my parents did, because uh, they have <laughs> reissued my parents' movie, which I've talked about, Copperhead. Uh, but the Copperhead soundtrack, they digitized it and they have, uh, they're going to be putting it out on vinyl and cassette later this year and also another album. Uh, so stay tuned to find out which other album because they release a lot of horror movie soundtracks. Mm -hmm. So if you like this episode, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash night clerk radio. We will have, we have bonus episodes every month, uh, every month. We, we have quite a few at this point and we have access to our discord. We have some really great discussions, a lot of cool links, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, we're working on some essays for our patrons and we are at night clerk radio on Twitter. I am at Ross Payton. Burke is at Burke McBurkinson. We are also on nightclerkradio.com. I have a Facebook page for night clerk radio. If you want to be reminded of new episodes on Facebook, I guess. Uh, and please rate and <laughs> review us on Apple podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Whatever you use, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell the ghosts haunting your house. Ghosts probably listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, what else are they going to do? Give your ghosts access to Alexa so they can listen to podcasts is what I'm saying. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. We'll uh, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.